So our next session, our next speaker would be Mustafa Amar. And like other speakers, he doesn't need much introduction. He has a whole suite of great, tremendous accomplishments and work in ranging from multicast to uh, network virtualization. And I know, and I apologize to the panelists before and after, because I know I'm not doing justice to your introduction, but honestly, I don't think any of you need introduction <laughs> at all. So over to you, Mustafa, for you to share your viewpoint on what things would look like 50 years from now. Share my, uh, my PowerPoint. Yep. So you can, um, you can see it. Okay. Uh, can you, let's see, let me do the. Are you seeing the transition? Yes, we are. Okay. All right. So let me uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak here. And uh, uh, and you know I'm, I think we have a, a tough task to to talk about networking in, uh, in 50 years. So I'm glad uh, I saw that you changed to 25 to 50. Maybe that's a little bit easier, but that's. Uh, uh, it's going to be a rough one, I think, uh, in terms of trying to predict. But so here are my takeaways. Just as we start, let me give you there are three things I think I want to really uh, three points I want to um, have you take away from from the, you know, my discussion. The first one is that uh, I think, uh, and and others have looked at history as well. Uh, and I think if you look at history, uh, you will see that. And not just for networking, but in a lot of different enterprises that things uh, work in an iterative manner um, and, and evolve in an iterative manner. And I, I, I believe networking has been the same. And I think understanding that is really important uh, for, for trying to predict what will happen in the future. Um, the other point I want to say, and I think that uh, will, will come from my uh, kind of analysis of what's happening in this uh, evolutionary process is that in the future, I think we're going to, we're going to really be running on many computer networks, uh, whether we will call them collectively the internet or the internet will be identified as one of them. Uh, think us post office versus uh, UPS and FedEx as, as kind of different delivery mechanisms that we're aware of. Uh, I think networking will, we will have similar things going on. Um, there's already strong evidence that this is already happening. Um, uh, and, and we'll point to that. Um, the third thing I want to say, and that actually goes to, to something that Jim said about uh, our previous encounters in some of the panels and other discussion. Um, I think the last time we were in a panel together, Jim, we were talking about network surprises, but that would have been probably 15, 20 years ago. That we were doing that. Um, and I think one thing I learned is that, you know, you can only predict so much because there are things that are going to happen to surprise you. Um, and, and so what I tried to do here is, is try to, to look at categories of things that where, where surprises might come up from and for us to be aware of uh, what, you know, what might happen uh, if these things kind of come to be. Okay, so, so the first thing I want to say, and I, did, I didn't do a deep dive in history like Henning did, but certainly 50 years from now is a long time from now. Uh, and the best way to, character, to understand that is to look 50 years ago and see uh, what was happening. And I'll just give you just one, one point. Uh, state of the art shopping in, in 1971 was the Sears uh, catalog. And these were, uh, you know, 1,000, 1,200 page catalogs that a lot of households, I would say almost all households, would have had copies of them. And, uh, and that was the way we did shopping. Uh, and if you've never seen them, this is what they look like. And they actually, all of, all of them have been preserved online, which is interesting. Um, so you could buy anything from TVs to shoes. Um, and certainly, you know, at that time, you could not have predicted that Sears would be out of business. I think they closed their last physical store in Chicago about a month ago. So, so certainly you could not have predicted that would, they would be out of business in 2021. Uh, if anything, you would have predicted they would probably ride any technology advances and so on. Um, so I think we're in the same position at this point, trying to predict what will happen 50 years from now. There are things that we probably can never predict or see. Um, but I also want to say now that, that 
the, the way we, we got to where we are in networking is basically by following a very simple uh, adage, which is necessity is the mother of invention, right? And that no one would disagree with this. And in networking, what that means is this. Uh, it, it means that uh, in this necessity is our need to support services, or I would add uh, also same service, but at a larger scale. So, so both scale and, and ser new services are things that are needed. And I, I, I think Jim mentioned this and others may have talked about this as well, that this is paramount in, in network technology that our uh, need to support services or support their scale is, uh, is really paramount and, and not really the underlying technology that gives it. But that is really the invention. So we, we tend to deploy, design and deploy infrastructure to support these kinds of things. So if you, you, know, if you want to say it in networking language, you would say service scale support motivates infrastructure deployment. And then you can uh, talk about this as a, as a cycle, which I call the service infrastructure cycle, that starts with, uh, with uh, someone wanting to do something or do something at a larger scale, and that would let us uh, deploy the infrastructure uh, to meet that requirement. But then, you know, we think of other things while we have that new infrastructure, and that causes us to do more, uh, to, to have new requirements or increase scale, which causes us to, um, to deploy even, you know, different infrastructure upgraded or something. And, and I think this is fundamental. I mean, it sounds really simple, but I think this, uh, this kind of explains a lot of things and actually helps us understand what some of what we're seeing now and some of what I'm predicting. Uh, there is a lot more detail here that argues for the cycle on an article I, I wrote for CCR uh, a couple of years ago. And, and uh, I will admit that this, the way I've done it is oversimplified and there's been actually some interesting work in the last year or so uh, to kind of flesh out some details on, on how things evolve. Um, this is out of a group at uh, Lancaster University in the UK. Uh, but let's, let's go back to the, to the simple cycle. Uh, so this worked for a while until I would say around 2005, we started hearing things like the network is not able to adapt to new pressures and requirements. And uh, this is what became known as network ossification. And it's really easy to explain once you understand that the things are, you know, there's a cycle that is cranking through the, to, to produce the networks. And basically, if the cycle gets stuck, uh, that's what ossification is. Again, nothing, you know, earth shattering here, but, uh, but it also means that we're not able to kind of keep going as we were going before to improve the infrastructure to uh, support new services. Um, and the, the, I think, and I think uh, we've heard it also from Jim that basically the demands uh, of the applications are paramount and they are, I would call them the unstoppable force um, that, you know, you, you can't just get in their way. There, there, there's certainly always increased scale. Uh, there is uh, you know, content provider requirements there. They have customers and they uh, have uh, quality of experience requirements, um, uh, low latency and, and other requirements. There's a lot of security, privacy, and resiliency requirement. There's also a very important motive here, which is, you know, all these providers need to be making money. So, so things have to be cost efficient. So if you take this unstoppable force, and of course, you know, what happens when an unstoppable force meets this immovable object that has just been hard to change, and what I will argue is, is this is exactly what is causing the, uh, this is my second point here, what is causing the internet uh, or networking in general to, to yield and, and change char in character. And, and, uh, and I'll pose it as a question, but certainly we're seeing today already this uh, one network that, uh, that we have put together kind of changing into a many network. And, you know, the analogy I have is, uh, is, is the one uh, between a Swiss army knife and a, and a box of tools. Uh, the Swiss army knife, of course, is a very practical thing to have in your pocket. Uh, it's very useful to do certain things, but if you, know, if you want someone to come and work in your house, you hope they come in with a box of tools and not take out a Swiss army knife and start you know, building out your basement. 
So, uh, you know, both have, both have uses. Um, the, the, you know, one tool fits all is, is really practical and useful in a lot of circumstances. But in a lot of other circumstances, we need professional grade tools. We need some more specialized equipment. And I think sim something similar is going on with Netflix. Uh, and uh, I'm now showing my age because I have access to even older books than Henning had. Um, I actually have even older than this one, but this is a book that actually I taught with. This is probably my first year as, as faculty or my first couple of years of faculty at Georgia Tech. Um, and in, in that book, uh, this is Misha Schwartz's book. Uh, uh, and in that book, basically, there was a lot of discussion about many, many types of networks and all the different approaches, different architectures, different protocols they use. Uh, you know, these, the, some of these networks were for work, some of them were for home, some of them were strictly experimental, some were actually um, specific to particular countries or regions. So, so this was the state of affairs in, you know, as late as 1987, probably well into the 80s, maybe even early 90s. Uh, at some point though, uh, you know, we started thinking of net uh, of, of this one network, basically. Uh, and I, I don't think in the network community we give this its due. I think uh, we, you know, the, there's a lot of kind of uh, taking for granted this particular development that at some point something happened that that um, that, uh, that where we now think of the network as just one single ubiquitous network that connects everything, and where we run all services. Um, and, and there, there were a lot of reasons, I think, for this. One of them is clearly that we were really just trying to get bit pipes to everyone. Uh, we needed to do this at scale and, uh, you know, economically. I would argue there was also some idealism. Uh, coincidentally, John Lennon re uh, released uh, Imagine in 1971, 50 years ago. And uh, for people that can look up the lyrics, but basically to paraphrase him, there was certainly idealism at the time and that, you know, crept into a lot of the technical world uh, where we thought of everything as, as one network and uh, wanting to connect all the world with that, with that one network. So, um, so I think that there were good reasons and actually we had, you know, it, it, it served a, a, a great purpose to, to, to do things this way. Uh, but I think increasingly now with this, the, the pressure of the cycle and the fact that the cycle is stuck, uh, that we are seeing, you know, computer network fragments. And so, um, there, are, there are many types of fragments. Let me just kind of gloss over some of them uh, relatively quickly. So clearly the internet as, as we know it is, is one of those pieces. And it's for now, I think it represents the majority of, of traffic. Uh, there are, I think, the, the bypass networks. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of them, and in fact, uh, as I have given similar talks, uh, I keep adding to this list. Uh, so, so there, you know, one of the older oldest bypass networks was the spread network that was giving low latency services for for uh, for financial transactions. That was a very simple network connecting only New York and Chicago. Uh, there, there are now other networks that do this. This is one for, for games to give you low latency for gaming applications, uh, you know, networks to give you priority for uh, first responders. Uh, this is a big, big one uh, that, that the IPX networks uh, is basically another internet, if you will, that, uh, that connects uh, uh, MNOs, uh, mobile network operators to give, to provide roaming. Uh, there are backplanes for various companies, and uh, this is another big one that connects uh, uh, end systems that are IoT, net, uh, IoT devices. Okay. Again, all of these are basically bypassing uh, what we would call the, the big internet today. Uh, and, and here's another one that connects uh, the cloud providers. Um, now, so, so this, this is kind of the, the big kind of different uh, uh, network uh, fragment category. There are other things, you can think of some of the things we do today in the network, uh, within the internet as, as a form of fragmentation. Uh, One hop networks, basically the, the, the view of most users 
into content providers is basically access ISP and content provider network. And, and you can think of that as a fragment of the internet that maybe we share the access ISP. Uh, there are things that are, are called zero hop networks, which are actually where your entire journey in the network is through your access ISP. You know, you can have a, a Netflix appliance already in, in your access ISP, so you would never need to leave it, right? So everything is within, uh, within that, that network. Um, conceptually, what's going on really is the content provider is creeping into the access network. So again, that's another form of fragmentation, I think, that might happen. Uh, so if you put it all together, this is what we might see. Uh, basically, uh, these different network paths, this is kind of the more traditional internet uh, path. Uh, but then, you know, I didn't talk about community ISPs, but this is uh, another kind of activity, especially in, in the developing world, uh, to, to, to connect to the internet. Uh, zero hop networks certainly are, are possible. And then there are these bypass networks that we've talked about. Some actually may run completely independently and not have to deal with any other part of the network. Uh, so, so these many nets actually, you know, it's, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I should be clear that I'm not really advocating having many networks. Uh, I'm just simply observing that they are occurring. Uh, there are really good things and bad things. And so the, the good thing, of course, is that, you know, you kind of uh, get rid of ossification just by definition, because now you can have networks to do different things. And, and as you think of new things, you either, if you're not able to modify uh, what you have, you can actually build new networks. Uh, uh, there is, I think, a lot of potential for infrastructure innovation that has been difficult when you try to, to do everything in one, in one network. Uh, you can have a lot more efficiency, cost efficiency, and, and better performance if things are tailored. Uh, it's unlikely you will get catastrophic failures like we saw with Facebook with these kinds of systems because there are lots of different alternatives. Uh, now, there are a lot of downsides. I think some of them are pretty serious, and we would have to think through that. Uh, if, if, if we want to avoid it, let's say. Um, and, you know, the one network, of course, provided low barrier to entry. I would say this is in principle, uh, but certainly in the early days, it was anyone could, could come on and build Netflix, for example, started that way. And Google started that way by building on the, you know, the, the big, the, the shared infrastructure that connected everyone. Uh, we have now a loss of, uh, of uh, egalitarian service agnostic mission of networking. And then we lose a lot of serendipity uh, in, in that, uh, you know, we have something and people can try things at low cost uh, and, and not commit to having to build you know, their own infrastructure. So certainly we would want to preserve some aspects of this uh, in, in the future. Um, Okay, now the last piece I want to I want to I want to talk about is uh, these different things that could surprise us, and you know some of them might you, know, you, you might already be thinking about. Uh, the, uh, let, let me just take them one at a time. Energy considerations. Um, that's kind of a given that you know there's going to be some energy uh, pain points uh, in the future, whether it's cost and whether it's uh, its uh, availability and you know there's a lot of discussion and I haven't really I don't know what to believe at this point but there's a lot of discussion about whether what's how much streaming for example uses in terms of electricity some say it uses a lot some say it doesn't use anything um, there is also the question of, of, of uh, you know availability and there's a lot of parts of the world that don't have 24 7 electricity but even more recently I was just came back from Bay Area uh, last night, and uh, just that on Monday they were talking about shutting down some uh, power to some to some cities in the Bay Area because of uh, bad weather. Uh, so anyway, so I think maybe we can get into a situation where we have really have to deal with this, and and some of the things we take for granted, like always on networking, for example, we might have to rethink. Another thing that uh, uh, is this movement that. Uh, Better, best called really as the slow media movement, although I don't quite like that because it, it has some connotations of something bad, but it's, it's 
It's really about deliberate content dissemination. So basically try to slow down uh, the, 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 the dissemination of information uh, to the point to where it becomes more credible and, and more sustainable. Uh, and there's a lot of this stuff. There's also this movement that thinks we're connecting too many things to the network. Um, and maybe we should, uh, we should be rethinking our, uh, you know, our goals of, of having the network basically intrude into everything we own and touch. Now, there is the other side of this, which is, uh, doesn't really have a name, but I'm calling it the extreme connectivity movement, which is technology for really ubiquitous computing and communication. And I don't know if you, any of you have seen this, but basically there is this work on something called the Internet of Materials. And this is now basically your, your uh, walls have ears. Well, you know, literally, the paint and the walls can actually hear you. It's self-powering. Uh, it can take and through but some kind of backscatter can move your data around. Uh, and uh, and now you know now we have basically the internet not just in internet of things but in essentially in every molecule around us. Um, uh, th this is uh, this is one of my favorite uh, science fiction books by Arthur C. Clarke and co-author Stephen Baxter. Um, the technology that they describe there is not interesting, I think, is, is not realistic, but I think the application, which is being able to dial in anything that happened at any time, we're getting very close to being able to do that. And I think uh, there, you know, there are some corners of the world that think this is a good idea. So, so that, that could happen. Uh, I think this has been mentioned already, the, the fact that we have network nationalism. Again, looking at you know, history in general of people movement, people used to be able to move very easily uh, across the world from country to country, and uh, that, that is, of course, increasingly difficult now. Uh, data might actually see the same thing happen to them. Uh, and you know, we've seen things that happens for some good reasons, like uh, some of the European restrictions on data leaving Europe. Um, and, and, but sometimes for other reasons, uh, this is um, Leonard Kleinrock talking about the balkanization of the internet uh, uh, as firewalls spring up around national networks. Uh, we've talked, we've seen how Russia is talking about building their own network that may not connect to the rest of the world. Um, and, and there's lots of talk about, uh, you know, many, many types of these networks that are national. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is basically something that could happen, which is a compelling need for training and accountability. Today, I think we, uh, we let people loose on the internet uh, without really thinking uh, a lot about their impact. And, and I think people understand the impact uh, more and more now. And, you know, if you go back historically with, the, for example, uh, automobiles, it took about 50 years from the invention of the automobile until people started requiring driver's licenses. And lots of controversy around that time. I think uh, one of the Dakotas in the U.S. didn't really have driver's licenses until the 1950s. So, uh, so you know, we may be starting to see, or we, we may start to see something like this, but it will all depend on whether people, there's enough, you know, societal pressure uh, to do this. Uh, you know, again, I'm sure many of you are in that situation. We train for everything at Georgia Tech, for security, for all sorts of other issues. Uh, we go through training that we have to get certified on and so on. And, uh, and I, I don't see why not for just letting people on the network that you can get uh, you, you would need to be trained and maybe certified. Um, and, you know, there, there is, um, the, you know, you could think of uh, internet licenses being of different scopes, just like driver's licenses. You know, you can drive a small car, but you can't drive a semi uh, unless you have a different kind of license and a different kind of training. And we can think of having the scope of someone's reach, reach in, an, in the network or the speed at which they're able to put data in into the network and be part of that. And again, you know, this is this is going looking really far into the future, uh, but I, I can see this possibly happening. So to, to wrap up here, um, I think 
we will continue to see evolution that is driven really by new services and by scale. Um, there, there is uh, no question that we need agile, flexible networking to to uh, to address some of you know these these new services and new scale, and we must do it in a way that things don't get stuck. Now there are a couple of there are different ways, and I've just described one way, but I that I see happening already. But I, it, it is possible that we maybe get off that track and do it some other way. Uh, I think what is really most most important to realize now is that there is really, you know, money to be made on the network, and 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 I think the recent past has proved some of this that basically businesses and applications are not going to wait uh, to to get their their you know business done uh, and, and so they will do their own thing if they have to um, I think there's a lot of outside societal and technical forces that that could significantly shape the network evolution in some really unpredictable ways um, I hope I get to see some of these surprises on that so thank you very much Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Thanks for this very interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, Wendy, are there any questions on the chat forum for Mustafa? There are. Um, the idea of driver license may be great, at least before content goes to wider audience. So say, say it again, Wendy, I didn't hear it at the beginning. It says that the idea of Driver license may be great, at least before content goes to wider audience. I yeah, know. yeah. I mean, I, and I, I, I didn't put it up, but I have actually, I've worked out some categories, you know, category A, B, C. You know, for example, you could think as a, as a teenager, you know, a 12 year old, you let them on the internet, but you only allow them to talk to, you know, immediate family uh, and not post stuff on, on Twitter for the whole world to hear. And then, you know, they get, and then you can think of, uh, you know, news organizations having a class E license, which is like equivalent to driving a semi on the highway. You know, you, you have some training and, and I think more importantly, I think you have accountability. That's what driver's license, I think, give you. So if you do something bad, they can catch you, you know, they are, there are, and there are rules of the road. And all this. So, I mean, I can, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm conflicted with this. I mean, I, you know, it's like, I, I don't want to have to do that myself, you know? So, but I'm just saying that if society ever feels that, that, that this is something that is affecting society as a whole, I could see it happening. And it's really actually very educational to look at the history of, of just regular driver's licenses and how controversial they were very early on. Uh, and how at the beginning you just, they just, wanted you to pay, it was a kind of a way to, to pay taxes. So it wasn't really, they didn't test you or anything. You just go, you paid your $2, you got your license and you were done. So it wasn't really, and then it slowly kind of evolved, but there's always a controversy, you know, people protesting and things like that. So, so I, you know, if this were ever to come to be, it would be very similar. I think it won't be an easy, straightforward thing to have. One more question, one more very interesting question. <laughs> What will be the role of uh, future of network infrastructure in reduction of CO2 footprint? So, you know, I, I, th I think here is, so, so if you look at what people are talking about in terms of energy usage uh, for, uh, for say video stream, uh, the problem I think comes with the fact that a lot of it is, is device dependent but even more of it is dependent on the on the server data center, and that technology actually has been riding a very steep wave of decline in terms of costs. So I think any uh, any estimate that one sees today is kind of uh, is behind because uh, it's not really based on the latest technology, um, and so it's very re it's very hard really to 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 kind of pin it down, and you get. You know, everything is basically coming from people with agendas, unfortunately. So I'm so far, I haven't really found anything that gives me a good feeling that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a number. Now, there is no question, there's no question that energy is going to be much more scarce. I and mean, we're talking 50 years from now. 
right? There's going to be some energy issues. There's going to be some climate issues uh, that are going to affect maybe our energy consumption. Um, now, you know, how fast that moves or whatever, I, I, I don't know. And whether, we're, whether we ever hit a scaling law in energy consumption, whether we can't get any better at some point, I don't know. So I, I don't really have an answer. All I'm saying is that things are, are moving in, in all sorts of directions, and um, there's really no good number out there that, that this I found that is either way. 